Several years ago, I don't know how many now, I preached a series through the Minor Prophets, the last several books of the Old Testament. And when it came Christmas time, a particular phrase stuck with me. And over the last few weeks as I've been praying about this transitional Sunday between Christmas and Easter, between Christmas and, that's the next time I'll see Sunday. So, no, no, sorry. <laughs> sorry, not this group. Uh, but that transitional Sunday between Christmas and New Year's, um, the, it came back to me. One of my favorite names of Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. And Isaiah 7:14, of course, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, in case we wondered what he was talking about, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and be, bring forth a son. They'll call his name Emmanuel, which is interpreted God with us. Matthew says this is the fulfillment of the promise of Isaiah. And then when I got to Zephaniah and Micah, and if you want to turn in your Bibles, those would be the two places to turn. And I know you're very familiar with both of them, and you'll turn right to Micah and Zephaniah. The easiest way to do that is find Matthew and then go left a few pages. Um, you'll find Zechariah and you'll find Haggai on one page, then you'll find Zephaniah and then a couple pages beyond that you'll find Micah. Zephaniah chapter 3 verse 17. The Lord your God is with you. This is an incredible verse. He is mighty to save. He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. And Micah chapter 5, verses 4 and 5. He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they will live securely. For then his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth, and he will be their peace. All of these verses and many more that we'll be looking at this morning have with it the theme of God being in our presence, God being in our midst, God with us. Now, obviously, the prophets were looking ahead to the time when Christ would be back on this earth and set up his kingdom, and it would be a political kingdom, and they were looking forward to that time. However, we know that many prophecies have a dual fulfillment and especially the prophecies relating to Christ and the coming of Christ have a dual fulfillment. They have the fulfillment of the day yet to come, the second advent, when Christ will come down to this earth, sit on the throne of David in Jerusalem, and rule and reign for that millennial time. But then many of those same principles apply to his first advent when he comes as the babe in a manger. And so many of the blessings that the prophets were looking forward to, that Israel will experience when Christ comes back to this earth the second time, we, as the church, can experience because Christ came to earth the first time. And so I want us to look at this phrase, God with us. Because as we're facing a new year, <coughs> and all the things that are going on in our lives, in our nation, it's important for us to remember that God is with us. You don't have to face it alone. You don't have to carry the burden alone. You don't have to go through the valley alone. God is with us. That is the fulfillment of his promise. Genesis chapter 3 verse 15 is the first promise of a redeemer. That the seed of the woman, Jesus would crush the head of the seed of the serpent, which would be the devil. And we know that's what happened on Calvary. Uh, the, Satan crushed the heel of Jesus because he certainly went through suffering and agony and death. But when Jesus came forth from the tomb on the third day, he dealt the death knell to Satan and crushed his head. And that's the good news. And, and no wonder for years uh, that, that him of Advent, O come, O come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel. We were looking forward for
for the day that the Redeemer would come. But he has always revealed himself. God revealed himself long before Jesus came. Now, as we said a couple of weeks ago, Jesus was God in living color. He, he was the, the embodiment of, and, you know, we saw the prophets before, and we saw other things, but we saw God when Jesus came to this earth. He said, if you've seen me, you have seen the Father. But imagine what it would have been like before sin in the Garden of Eden. The Bible says that God came down in the cool of the day and walked with Adam and Eve. That's an amazing picture of God fellowshipping with his creatures, with his creation. That's why he made us. He made us for fellowship with himself. And, and, and what an incredible sense of God with us that was. Think about Daniel and the lions then. The lions were hungry. <laughs> Daniel was a good meal. But the angel of the Lord was there and shut the lions' mouths. God with us. We think of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. But remember what the king said? Didn't we throw feet, three people in there? I see four. And the fourth is like the Son of God. God with us through the fires. He is with us through His Son. A virgin shall conceive, bring forth a son. You'll call His name Jesus. He'll save His people from their sins. I think many times at Christmas we forget that Jesus is not still a baby. You know? He is no longer the baby. He is now the Lion of the tribe of Judah. And He is with us through His Son. Jesus walked on this earth. It's an amazing thing. Some of you have probably been to the Holy Land, and the people who've been to the Holy Land come back and they say, the most incredible thing was to realize I was walking where Jesus walked. And, and when the, the disciple John in 1 John wanted to emphasize to us that this was not a myth, this was not some kind of a vision, he said, we touched him with our own hands, and we heard him with our own ears, and we saw him with our own eyes. He was here, God with us through his son. And as I said last week, that gives us the assurance that when we pray, we're praying to a God who understands, because he's been here. He was tempted in all points like as we are. He suffered everything that we suffered, yet without sin. And so when we pray, God, you know, if you listen, you'll hear him say, yeah, I know. Uh, his t-shirt says, been there, done that, have the scars. He came to this earth, God with us. But, remember that when Jesus went back to heaven, he said, John chapter 14, I will not leave you comfortless, I will send you another comforter. Now, in the Greek language, which the New Testament was primarily written in, there are two words for another. One means another of a different kind. All of you who've had more than one child understand another of a different kind, right? The first one is so sweet, and then, you know, and then the second one came, you know, or whatever the order was for you. Uh, that's another of a different kind. <laughs> but, but the word Jesus used was another of the same kind, which means just as Jesus was God with us here, so when he went back to heaven, he sent the Holy Spirit to be God with us now. He is with us through His Spirit. He gave us the Holy Spirit to walk with us and talk with us and to fellowship with us. And just as Jesus was God with us in the first century, so the Holy Spirit is God with us now. Except He can be with all of us, wherever we are, all the time. God with us. It's the fulfillment of a promise. Second, God is with us in the dailiness of our lives. I think we can all identify with the lady who said the problem with life is that it's just so daily. You know, and it is, I mean, it just, just, here we go again, right? But God is with us in the dailiness of our lives. And, and that picture in Micah chapter 5, verse 4, <coughs> that says, He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they will live securely, for then his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth, and he will be their peace. 
he will stand and shepherd his flock. Last year we spent many weeks looking at the 23rd Psalm and studying Christ as the Good Shepherd. Here's the picture from the Old Testament prophet Micah. He will stand and shepherd his flock. The King James says, feed his flock. Now I learned a whole lot about sheep and shepherds you know, as I was preparing the series on the 23rd Psalm. But I understand that in England, the most indispensable accessory, if you ask a shepherd, are what they call their wellies, which are the tall green Wellington boots. Because a good shepherd knows that it's his job to be right in the middle of the flock. And if he's in the middle of the flock, the ground is not always going to be clean. And he needs something to protect his feet. And he wears those boots. Jesus chose to use that analogy to describe his presence with us, our shepherd. He is engaged in the hands-on, dirty work of being a shepherd. He will stand and feed his flock. I learned that when a shepherd feeds its flock, it's chaos. It's kind of like if you ever risk going to Golden Corral on a Sunday afternoon. It's just chaos. Enough to make you lose your religion. <laughs> but when a shepherd stands and feeds his flock, he's in the middle of the flock with the food. And sheep are not polite. And they don't stand in line and patiently wait their turn. They're jostling for position. So his feet are getting stepped on by those hooves and his fingers are being nibbled on by those sheep trying to get to food and, and, and there's filth everywhere. And, and so, you know, when you have this gorgeous picture of they were in the same country, shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. You don't imagine that. But that's what's going on. And Jesus chose to say to us, that's who I am. I'm your shepherd. I'm in the middle of the mess. I'm in the middle of your chaos. I'm always scraping off the bottom of my shoes. But I'm with you as you go through it too. And as I was working on that study through the, the minor prophets, I was struck at how many times they talked about Jesus being, the King James word is, in our midst. Let me just give them to you. Hebrews 11, ver or Hosea 11, verse 9, the Holy One is in the midst of thee. Joel 2, 27, you will know that I am in the midst of you, and I am the Lord your God. Zephaniah 3, 5, the just Lord is in the midst thereof. Verse 15, the King of Israel, even the Lord, is in the midst of thee. Verse 17, the Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. Zechariah chapter 2, verse 5, I will be a wall of fire around her. I will be the glory in the midst of her. Zechariah 2.10, Sing and rejoice, daughter of Zion, for lo, I come and I will dwell in the midst of thee. Zechariah 2.11, I will dwell in the midst of thee. Every once in a while, the church world just irritates me. I guess preachers aren't supposed to confess that, but it's true. One of those times happened a few years ago when Bette Midler sang her song, From a Distance, God is Watching Us from a Distance. What irritated me was that Christian bookstores were selling that dis demonstration track and the soundtrack, and people were singing it in church. It's such a glorious song that God is watching us from a distance. That is not the message of the gospel. The message of the gospel is God is with us. What good is he at a distance? He's with us. God is watching us from a distance. No, he's not. He's walking with me and talking with me, and he is in the midst of us. Sharing our suffering, sharing our sorrow, sharing our pain in the midst of us. We don't need an aloof, distant God, or at least I don't. 
I need somebody that I can say before I finish saying the second syllable of Jesus, he's here. You know, we need a God with us. He's always been in the midst of the mess. He started out that way in the stable. He spent his whole life in the midst. At his birth in a manger. His life, not one of privilege, one of blue collar, hard work, manual labor. His first visitors were the shepherds. The shepherds were not the hierarchy of society. The rabbis had a rule. If you walk past a ditch and there was somebody in the ditch, you had to help them out. Unless it was a shepherd, you could leave the shepherd in the ditch. That's where they were. Only the lepers in first century society were lower than the shepherds. And who does God send the first good news to? To the shepherds. He's saying to us, I'm in the midst of you. I'm in the blue collar, harsh realities of life. I'm not sheltered. I'm not privileged. I am in the midst of you. You face uncertainty. You remember as a child, he and his parents had to flee to Egypt. You ever feel like you're in hand-to-hand -hand combat with the devil? He was in the midst of that as he started his public ministry and he went out for the wilderness for those 40 days of hand-to-hand -hand combat with Satan. If you're in a storm, you remember that he was with his disciples in the midst of the storm in the Sea of Galilee and stood up and said, Peace, be still. If you're facing doubts and fears, and we all do from time to time, you remember John the Baptist sent his, him a message and Jesus stood in the midst of doubt and fear when John the Baptist asked him, are you really the one? People let you down? Do you ever hear of Judas? You ever had intense pain over a challenge in your life? And have you heard Jesus say, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me? He's in the midst of us. He is Emmanuel, God with us in the dailiness of of our lives. Whatever it is that's facing you this week, whatever it is that's facing you this year, the good news is He is Emmanuel, God with us. And that brings peace. This is the CEV paraphrase of Micah 5, 4 and 5. Like a shepherd taking care of his sheep, this ruler will lead and care for his people by the power and glorious name of the Lord his God. His people will live securely, and the whole earth will know his true greatness, because he will bring peace. Now we know that he's looking forward, ultimately, to where Christ comes back and sets up his kingdom, and Israel will be secure once and for all. But also, he wants to be our peace. And when we recognize that he is with us, we will experience his peace. We've talked before when we studied the 23rd Psalm about how the sheep that are the most placid and peaceful are the sheep that stay the closest to the shepherd. When you realize your shepherd is with you and when you stay close to him, that brings peace. I love that. He will be their peace. If you read the rest of that chapter, you'll see what God is going to do when Christ comes back and sets up his kingdom and brings ultimate peace to Israel. But he wants to be your peace also. There are so many verses that you want to preach on all of them every year, but Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. In the midst of the chaos of the Christmas season, it's kind of ironic because Christ came to bring us peace. However, to have that peace, we have to make a decision. And so to change it from God with us to God with me, that depends on me. And that's where Zephaniah chapter 3 comes in. See, you can know the Lord and still not be at peace. You know, you can know that he's your savior and still not find that peace. But Zephaniah chapter 3, that incredible verse, 17. The Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. 
that follows verse 14 where he says, Sing, O daughter of Zion, shout aloud, O Israel, be glad and rejoice with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. Now we've got to realize when Zephaniah wrote this prophecy, the children of Israel had been defeated. The best of them had been taken into captivity. They had not listened to God's warning. As a result of that, they lost their nation. And they're in captivity. And they're under the rule of another nation. And the prophet comes to them and says, Sing and shout aloud. Really? <laughs> you know, anybody can sing when the sun's shining bright. But as the old song says, you need a song in your heart at night. And here's Israel in the darkest night of their history as a nation, and the prophet saying, sing. <laughs> don't wait. Yes, the Messiah's coming back, and he's going to set it all right. But, but don't wait till then to start singing. Sing now. Be glad and rejoice now. <coughs> In anticipation of what you're going to receive. Some people have decided that they're going to be happy when they get back to the pant size or the dress size they were in high school or college. <laughs> to dream the impossible dream. No. <laughs> but, you know, and, and other people are going to be happy when I finally get out of debt or the house finally gets paid off or I have this much money in my retirement or, or whatever based on some kind of materialistic thing. But then there are other people who have decided, I'm going to rejoice now. I'm going to celebrate now. Yes, there are problems. No, things aren't perfect. But there are still things to celebrate. And the greatest thing of all to celebrate is Emmanuel, God with us. Jesus saves his people from their sins. The loving, faithful promise of a God who says, I will be your peace. Rejoice now. Don't make it your New Year's resolution to start being joyous. Be joyous today. You can wait till New Year's to start your diet, but rejoice today. Celebrate the goodness and the faithfulness and the promise of God today because the reality of his first coming gives us the assurance of his second coming. But this is the incredible... So that's up to you. Whether you're going to rejoice now or later, that's up to you. Just rejoice now. Just a whole lot better, just to rejoice now. But verse 17 of Zephaniah 3 tells us that God with us brings delight to us and to God. This is an incredible verse. There's three things that Zephaniah says in this verse. He says he will take delight in us. Isn't that just phenomenal? He will take delight great delight in you. Now, when God sees the nation of Israel restored and Jesus on the throne of David, he will rejoice. But when he sees us now, who have accepted the sacrifice of his son, who are now part of his family, who are now the church, he rejoices over us. He takes delight in in us. I heard a preacher preach one time at a funeral, uh, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. And he said, what is it about the death of a saint of God that makes it precious in the sight of the Lord? And he said, it's because this saint is the ultimate proof that salvation is real. And, and the sacrifice of Christ is real. Because here is a saint who has put their faith in Christ and what Christ did on the cross. And now they're in heaven and God can say, ah, oh, this is precious. Because this is real. Yeah. And, and when you and I accept the sacrifice of Christ on the cross for our sins, when we ask Him to forgive us and ask Him to come into our life, that brings God great delight because that's why He gave His Son. Don't you love it when you give a gift to somebody and six months later they say, man, I'm still using that every day. It was the greatest thing. Thank you very much. You know, When, when God sees us Living in the blessings of salvation brings him delight. So I guess the question ought to be, 
Am I bringing God delight? When he looks at me, do I give him delight? Or do I give him chills? <laughs> oh, Wilson, please, come on. You know? Don't you want to live your life to give God delight? He will delight in us. And then he says, he will quiet you with his love. <coughs> There's a couple of different translations of these Hebrew words here. One is, he will be silent in his love. And commentators believe that he's referring to a couple of different things there. One is, he no longer has to work because the work of salvation is completed. And you remember the Hebrew writer says that when Jesus rose from the dead, he went to the, back to heaven and sat down. Now, a high priest in Israel always stood up because they were always making sacrifices. Because the sacrifice of bulls and goats can't take away sin, so they had to do it again at noon, and then they had to do it again in the evening, and then they had to do it again the next day. But Jesus, his sacrifice is once for all times. So he went up to heaven and just sat down and said, okay, I'm done. I've done my part. And he sat down and he was quiet in his love. He's silent now as far as working for salvation. But I, I like, just personally, I like the idea of quiet love, silent love. You remember back, you all remember back when you were dating and, and you just hung on the phone? Nobody said anything. You just listened to each other breathe. You know, that's, that's silent love. Or maybe as a husband and wife now, you, you're sitting in a car and you take it, you never have to say anything to, at all. You know, just quiet love. I remember Robert Schuler said that when his dad died, uh, his mom said, I miss him so much. And, and Dr. Schuler said, he never said a word. He just sat in the chair. And she said, yeah, but he was here. You know, that, that silent love, that silent love. I like that. I, I think I told you a couple of weeks ago about the lady that I ministered to at the hospital who just said, you know how it is when you meet your soulmate, how you don't even have to speak to each other, you just kind of know what each other's thinking? She said, I want that with God. And I was able to tell her that's what Jesus came to give us. He will be silent in his love. But the other possible translation of that is he will quiet us with his love. And that's the picture of a fussy baby who when mama takes it in its arms, it snuggles up to her and please Lord, right? Quiets down. It's the picture we talked about a few weeks ago of, of the mother hen gathering her chicks to calm them. He wants to quiet us with his love. When I get a little too stressed out, and a little too uptight, it's usually a sign that I need to let the Lord quiet me with his love <laughs> and, and just kind of, you know, pat my head and rub my shoulder and say, calm down, Wilson, it's going to be okay, I got this. He will quiet us with his love. What a beautiful, that's what Jesus came to do, to be your peace, to quiet you and calm you with his love. But nothing can prepare you for he will rejoice over you with singing. Oh my. God sings over us? There's something about what Jesus did on the cross that makes God sing. Because the salvation is completed in the finished work of Christ on the cross. He rejoices over us with singing. God's joy has a song. Hmm. Let's make sure that what he sings over us is a good song, right? He's, he rejoices over us with singing. What this verse gives us is a glimpse into how God celebrates Christmas. Because he says, look at what I'm doing for you through my son. If you'll allow him, he will be your peace. He will keep you calm. He will be with you in the midst of the mess of life. And God says, I don't know if he sings the hallelujah chorus or what he sings, but, but he sings something that says, this is good. And it is. You ever had somebody drive a long, long way just to be with you for just 
half a day and then they had to go back. And he said, man, I can't believe somebody took all that time just to come see me for a little bit. Well, God went way out of his way to come spend some time with us and to be Emmanuel, God with us. I called this message, I think I put the title in, God's Christmas Presence, P-R-E-S-E-N-C-E, because that's really what Christmas is all about. God with us in the midst of our lives. We thank you for your great love for us. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for being willing to leave heaven, come down to this earth to live as a man among us in our midst. And we thank you that you are still in our midst. And in the dailiness of our lives, may we sense your presence. May we know that you are with us, making us more than conquerors through you. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you May he make his face to shine upon you and give you his peace now and evermore. Amen. God bless you. Thanks for coming out today.